Welcome back. We're talking about the impact of policy objectives announced at this week's meetings in China. Joining us from Beijing is the director of the China National Association of International Studies, Victor Gao. With us here in Washington is Yoshikazu Kato. He's a visiting scholar at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And joining us from Berlin is Germany's former ambassador to China and Japan, Volker Stanzel. Gentlemen. Welcome to all of you. Victor Gao, what were the headlines for you that came out of uh, the meetings in Beijing? Well, the uh, National People's Congress, as well as the CPPCC, which stands for Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, are happening as we speak. Uh, these are two uh, landmark meetings every year. And this year, it draws particular attention. One is when the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said that the targeted GDP growth rate for 2015 will be downgraded to 7 percent, from 7.5 percent. So I think a lot of uh, discussion and analysis will center around this softening up and slowing down of the economic uh, development in China. Anti-corruption remains a top priority in China, and also environmental protection and pollution. Both air as well as uh, water and now newly added soil pollution are all becoming major concerns in China. So I think right now China is in the midst of this uh, annual session of a lot of debate, discussion, policy, uh, arguments, etc. But eventually, uh, in a seven day or eight days time, hopefully we will have greater consensus among the decision makers, the delegates and the members of the CPPCC for how China should go forward for this year. Ambassador, you've been closely involved in the relationship between China and Europe. What will Europe be looking for from these meetings in Beijing? Well, of course, uh, attention will be focusing on the downgrading of the growth target. Um, downgrading it is probably good for a mature economy as uh, China is becoming one. But of course, it means that there's less business opportunities for foreign companies in China, which at first sight seems uh, like um, enormous change for foreign companies used to great profits. In the longer term, I think, however, it means that uh, the relationship will become more normal, and that means also more stable. So basically, I think it's heading in a good direction from the point of European companies. Carter, what do you make yeah. of that 7% growth rate? That is a downgrading, as our two other guests have been talking about. What did you make of it? Yeah, of course, you know, it's, it's downgrading. But the more important is not 7%, but about 7%. Actually, you can't emphasize the 7%, about 7%, so probably even less, 6.8, or probably 6.8 to 7.2. .7, but I think but the more important is how to take balance between economic growth and structural reform, and the latter one is uncertain, still remain uncertain. So probably from the long run, like Ambassador said, you know, for, for the foreign companies, Chinese economies should be more sophisticated, more regulated, less restricted. So, you know, in terms of anti-monopoly, you know, or in, in terms of easing the foreign company restrictions, I think if Chinese economy could be more, more sophisticated under the less, you know, high economic grade, I think that would be better. But in terms of Japanese companies, probably, you know, Chinese markets should be more, you know, regulated, less restricted. That could be fine, I think so. Victor Gao, two things I want to ask you. One is what Kato has just been talking about here, and that is an easing of restrictions on foreign companies doing business in China. Did we see anything uh, that is encouraging in that respect? And the other is what kind of impact is a 7% growth rate going to have on employment jobs in China? Well, first of all, I would say that for the record, over the past 35 to 36 years, foreign invested companies have played a very important role in China, helping China in the initial stage and then sharing more and more the economic benefits out of the rapid economic development in China. Going forward, I would say foreign companies will still and continue to have a very important role to play. And I think in China, we should continue to adopt this open policy the more foreign investments in China, the more foreign companies operating in China, the better. And uh, of course, in about three decades during the China's reform and opening to the outside world, foreign invested companies actually enjoyed super national treatment. That means their tax policies, other favorable policies granted for foreign invested companies were actually better 
than domestic Chinese companies enjoyed. This is unprecedented, and this is extraordinary, and I don't think any other country had this kind of a policy. Now it's kind of a normalization. That means foreign companies and the Chinese companies enjoy the same tax considerations, and there is no longer favorable uh, tax policies granted only to foreign companies. Uh, may, may, I come, may I come in? Uh, I mean, uh, you see me smiling here, and you, uh, I think, uh, imagine that I have to contradict here. Um, first of all, I, I underline that uh, the lowering of the growth target is positive, both from a foreign point of view and also, I think, from the point of view of the Chinese consumer. But the situation of foreign invested companies in China is a totally different matter. First of all, Mr. Gao, a lot of countries give preferential treatment to foreign investment they want to attract. Think of Ireland or so. Uh, but uh, so uh, China's not specific uh, and very special in that regard. But when I was ambassador in 2006, Germany had the EU presidency and we initiated a campaign which was called We Are Chinese Companies Too. Why? Because European companies felt so strongly uh, that uh, they were at a disadvantage wherever they were um, trying to invest. Now, we had the Ministry of Foreign Trade on our side, but we didn't have on our side the authorities in the provinces who always tended, and nowadays tend even more, to give preferential treatment to Chinese companies. And let me give a concrete, a very recent example, which is the introduction of a kind of um, Chinese intranet instead of its uh, connection to the World Wide Web, which means a great disadvantage for foreign companies in China when they communicate with the outside, and in the end also for Chinese companies who want to communicate with their foreign partners abroad. Kato, let's talk about the relationship between China and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a talk of economic reforms. How will that impact the relationship? I think it is good, you know, as uh, Dr. Gao said, uh, you know, Chinese economy could reform and going forward, I think it is good for Japan-China relationship. And, and also, you know, if Chinese economy could be sophisticated and, you know, it could realize the structural reform from the long run, of course, I think the Japanese firms could, you know, benefit, could have a great benefit. Uh, from that, and I think it's a great impact for Japan-China relation. Of course, you know, for, in terms of Japan-China relationship, the political stability would be, you know, precondition. So I think the J Japanese Prime Minister and Chinese President should, you know, stabilize the political surroundings and push for the economic reform. That could be fine. But I think now, probably Chinese economy is entering the new chapter, and I'm concerned about innovation from long run. That would be really necessary. So I really think, you know, as previous days. Japanese companies should support Chinese structural reform and push forward the innovation process, that would be fine. And in this sense, Chinese, if Chinese market could be more transparent and more sophisticated, I think, I think this is a really good you know, signal for future Japan-China relationship. Right. Victor Gao, I want to ask you about this. You mentioned this in your initial answer at the beginning of the uh, segment. You talked about uh, Chinese attempts to um, do something about the environment. We know that China has a serious problem with uh, air pollution in its uh, cities, but it's also uh, come to an agreement with the United States <clears throat> on how it will tackle global uh, climate change. What did we hear from this conference about those two issues? Well, the Chinese Premier, again, in his uh, report on the work of the government this year, as well as what he did last year, on both occasions, he declared a war on pollution, and I think this is the right thing to do. Pollution in China, uh, covering, as I said, air pollution, soil pollution, and water pollution, is really becoming a serious problem. And I, I think people can see it, they can feel the pain, and I think uh, they are very dissatisfied with the seriousness and the extent of the pollution, not only in cities, but I would say that at present it's covering about you know, uh, the coastal area from the north all the way to the south. So it's really becoming a serious problem. Now, I would say talking the right talk is not sufficient for the Chinese government as well as the Chinese people. We also need to do the right thing and walk the right walk. But how to do it and how to achieve a new paradigm of development, which includes both economic development, but also environmental protection, how to reconcile these two seemingly irreconcilable goals. That's the challenge that we as a government, as a nation, uh, are faced with. So I would say in this uh, National People's Congress and CPPCC session, 
a lot of discussions are about how we need to do, what we need to do to really combat the consequences of pollution. I personally believe we need to make this fundamental leap of faith to come up with this new paradigm of green development. That is, we can still continue to push our economic development, but yes, by doing so, we also want to protect our environment and deal with the consequences of pollution at the same time. So this requires courage, vision, as well as audacity and uh, wisdom for the whole nation to figure out how to reach the higher level of green development. Ambassador, one other key number that came out of the meeting was uh, Chinese defense spending. Military spending will increase by 10 percent. That, of course, is the lowest increase that China has announced in years. What did you make of that? I think, uh, yes, it's the lowest increase that we've seen, 12 years, 12 percent, I think it was last year. Of course, in absolute terms, it's still an increase. The question is not that a country such as China is increasing its defense budget and that it wants to build up military strength. The question is how to explain that mainly to its neighbors and its partners. I think transparency and communication on what is to be achieved with the means available through that increase are crucial in resolving any doubts about this increase. Okay, and I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it. We've run out of time. Thanks for joining us to all of you.